I thank the Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I'm sure my colleagues are aware of the situation in Harney County, Oregon, where a group of uh, protesters uh, armed have overtaken a federal facility, the National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, this group is led largely uh, by people who are not necessarily from Oregon, although they obviously have supporters from Oregon. Um, they are originally there to protest the sentencing of uh, Dwight and Steve Hammond. I know the Hammonds. I've known them for probably close to 20 years. They're longtime responsible ranchers uh, in Harney County. Um, they have been sentenced to prison, not once, but now twice, and I'll get into that in a moment. But the point I want to make at the outset here is for people in this chamber to understand what drives people to do what's happening tonight in Harney County. I've had the great honor and privilege to represent Harney County for a number of years. I have seen the impact of federal policies from the Clinton administration to the Obama administration. I have seen what happens when overzealous bureaucrats and agencies go beyond the law and clamp down on people. I have seen what courts have done. And I have seen the time for Congress to act, and then it has not. I want to put this in perspective because I think it's really important to understand how big this region is. My congressional district in Oregon is something like the seventh or eighth biggest in the Congress by size. If you overlaid it over the East Coast, it would start in the Atlantic and end in Ohio. The county where this uh, occupation is taking place, Harney County, is over 10,000 square miles, and there are 7,000 souls inhabiting it. If my math is right, that's one person for every 1.4 miles. One person for every 1.4 miles. It's 10 times the size of Rhode Island, just this one county. It's larger than the state of Maryland. And 72% of it is under the command and control of the federal government. It is the public's land. That is true. But what people don't understand is the culture, the lifestyle of this great American West. And how much these ranchers care about the environment, about the future, about their children, about America. And how much they believe in the Constitution. And now we see the extent they will go to defend what they view as their constitutional rights. Now, I am not defending armed takeovers. I do not think that's appropriate. And I think the time has come for those to consider that they've made their case in the public about what is happening in the West, and perhaps it's time for them to realize they've made their case and to go home. But I want to talk about what happened with the Hammonds. And I want to, per in perspective of what happens almost every year, district, and that is these enormous wildfires. The Miller Homestead wildfire in 2012 burned 160 thousand acres, mostly in this county, if not all, 250 square miles, quarter the size of the state of Rhode Island. That was just in 2012. The Berry Point fire that year in Lake County next door burned 93,000 acres. Last summer uh, alone, uh, we burned 799,974 acres across Oregon. That's both forest and high desert. 2012, 3.4 million acres burned in Oregon. There was another fire in Malheur County, the Long Draw Fire in 2012, burned 557,000 acres, five times the size of Rhode Island. So 93,000 acres, 557,000 acres, 160,000 acres, all burning. The Hammonds are in prison tonight for setting a backfire that they admit to that burned 139 acres. And they will sit in prison 
time served, and time going forward, five years. Under a law that I would argue was never intended to mete out that kind of punishment. And I'll get that to a moment. I've told you I worked with the Hammonds and many ranchers in Harney County. In the last years of the Clinton administration, despite their own agencies, reviews, and analysis, Bill Clinton threatened to create a giant monument on Steens Mountain. And when Secretary Babbitt, Interior Secretary at the time, came before the House Resources Committee, of which I was a member, I said, Mr. Secretary, your own resource advisory committees in the area just reported that there was no need for additional protection on Steens Mountain, and yet you and the President are threatening national monument. Why do you waste the time of the citizens to go through a process to determine if additional protections are needed and then ignore what they came up with? To Bruce Babbitt's credit, he agreed when I told him I think you'd be surprised about what the local ranchers and citizens of Harney County would be willing to do if you gave them a chance. To his credit, he said, all right, I will give them that chance. And he did. We went to work on legislation. It took a full year. I worked with the Hammonds. I worked with Stacy Davies. I worked with all kinds of folks. Put a staffer on it full time, multiple staffs. And we worked with the environmental community and others. And we created the Steens Mountain Cooperative Management and Protection Act. Model legislation, never been done before, because I said, we don't have to live by past laws. We write laws. So we wrote a new law to create a cooperative spirit of management in Harney County. Hammonds were part of that discussion. They say uh, we saved a running camp that uh, Harlan Wyarty runs. We protected inholder. We tried to do all the right things and create the kind of partnership and cooperation that the federal government and the citizens should have. Let me fast forward on that particular law. Not long after that became law, and it was heralded as this monumental law of great significance and new era and cooperation and spirit of cooperation. Some of those involved on the other side and some of the agencies decided to reinterpret it. And the first thing they tried to do is shut down this kid's running camp because they said, well, too many, maybe more than 20, run down this canyon back up, as they had for many, many years. So they wanted to shut it down. So we had to fight them back, said, no, the law says historical standards. Then the bureaucrats because we said you should have your historical access to your property if you're up on Steens Mountain. You should maintain that access like you've always had it. Do so you know what the bureaucrats said? They began to solicit from the inholders in this area, how many times did you go up there last year? You see, they wanted to put a noose around the neck of those who were inside. That was a total violation of what we intended. And we had to back them off. See, the bureaucracy wants to interpret the laws we write in ways they want. And in this case, they were wrong. Not once, but twice. And then a couple of years ago, I learned that despite the fact we created the first cow-free wilderness in the United States under this law, and said clearly in this law, that it would be the responsibility of the government to put up fencing to keep the cows out as part of the agreement. The Bureau of Land Management said, no, we're not going to follow that law. And they told a rancher they had to build a fence. I networked with my Democrat colleague, Mr. DeFazio from Oregon, who was part of writing this law. I said, Peter, you remember that, right? He said, yeah, I didn't like it, but that was the case. BLM still wouldn't listen. So we continued to push it. And they argued back. Well, it turns out there had been a second rancher who brought this to my attention, who they were telling had to do the same thing, build the fence, when the government was supposed to, under the law I wrote. The agency, the arrogance of the agency, was such that they said, we don't agree with you. Now, there aren't many times, Mr. Speaker, in this job when you can say, I know what the intent of a law was. But in this case, I could because I wrote the law. I knew the intent. Oh, that wasn't good enough. No, no, no. No, no, no. The arrogance of these agency people was such that we had to go to the archives and drag out the boxes from 2000 and, uh, well, 2000, 99, 2000, when we wrote this law, 
from the hearings that had all the records for the hearings and the floor discussion to talk about the intent. And our, our retired member, George Miller, actually we used some of his information where he said the government would provide the fencing. They were still reluctant to follow it. So I put language in the appropriations bill that restated the federal law. Do you understand how frustrated I am at this? Can you imagine how the people on the ground feel? Can you imagine? If you're not there, you can't. If you're not there, you can't. You ridicule them. Yeah, Portland, Oregonians running a thing. What do you send them, uh, you know, uh, meals for militia? Let's have fun with this. This is not a laughing matter from any consequence. Nobody's going to win out of this thing. This is a government that has gone too far for too long. Now, I'm not condoning this takeover in any way. I want to make that clear. I don't think it's appropriate. There's a right to protest. I think they've gone too far. But I understand and hear their anger. Right now, this administration secretly, but not so much, is threatening in the next county over, that looks a lot like this one, Malheur County, to force a monument of two and a half million acres, we believe. I think this is outrageous. It flies in face of the people and the way of life and the public access. Uh, there's a company, Keen Shoes. It already has a big marketing campaign. This is about selling shoes, for God's sakes. I call on the president, if he wants to help reduce the tension that's out there, to walk away from this. And if he doesn't want to walk away and say, no, we're not going to do that, to help us bring down this level of frustration and anger, then at least be honest, or his Secretary of Interior needs to be honest with us and tell us they are going to do it. Here they are or they aren't, but all they are is being coy. That feeds into this. It feeds into the anger that I feel. It feeds into the anger out there. So the president should say, I'm not going to do a national monument. I'm not going to add more fuel on this fire in the West. We've fought other issues. More than half of my district is under federal management, or lack thereof. They've come out with these proposals to close roads into the forests. They've ignored public input. <clears throat> they often claim to have all these open meetings and listen to the public, and then, in the case of allow Whitman, the forest supervisor, who was eventually relieved because of this, I believe, completely ignored all the meetings, all the input, all the work of the counties and the local people, and said, forget it, I'm going my own direction. There were 900 people turned out at the National Guard Armory where they had a public hearing, standing room only and beyond, furious. You see, how do you have faith in a government that doesn't ever listen to you? How do you have faith in a government that when elected representatives write a law, those charged with the responsibility of implementing it choose to go the other direction and not do so? That is what's breaking faith between the American people and their government. And that's what has to change. The other thing that has to change is the law under which the Hammonds were sentenced. Now, they, they probably did some things that weren't legal. I've given you the size of the acreages that burn naturally. I haven't gotten into the discussion about how these fires are often fought and how the Federal government frequently will go on private land and set a fire without permission to back burn. That happens all the time. In fact, in the Berry Point fire down in Lake County, they set fire on private timber land as a back burn while the owners of the property were putting out spot fires down in the canyon. I drove down there afterwards. They're darn lucky to have come out alive. There's nobody sentenced under the Terrorism Act there. Oh, heck no. It's the government. They weren't sentenced. Nobody was charged. Oh, it just happened. Now, fires are tough to fight. 
I have great respect for firefighters. There are always two sides on how these fires get fought, but I can tell you a few years back in Harney County, because I went and held a meeting out there right as the fire was being put out, that the fire crews came in, went on private ground, lit a backfire on private ground behind a fence line that then burned out the farmer's fence, the rancher's fence, and burned all the way over and down into a canyon where there was a wetland, which would have been the natural break to stop the fire from the other side. You see, they never needed to burn that land. These things happen in the course of fighting fire. doesn't mean they're right. But rare is it that somebody ends up five years in prison. Let me tell you what the senior judge said when he sentenced the Hammonds the first time. Judge Michael Hogan, senior federal judge, highly respected in Oregon. He sentenced Dwight Hammond to three months to a year there were different offenses here and he said I am not going to apply the mandatory minimum and because to me to do so under the Eighth Amendment would result in a sentence which is grossly disproportionate to the severity of the offenses here the judge went on to say and with regard to the anti-terrorism and effective death penalty act of 1996 this sort of conduct would not have been conduct intended under the statute. When you ask, you know, what if you burn sagebrush in the suburbs of Los Angeles and their homes up the ravines, it might apply. Out in the wilderness here, I don't think that's what the Congress intended. And in addition, it just would not meet any idea I have of justice proportionality. It would be a sentence which would shock the conscience to me. Close quote. Senior Judge Mike Hogan, when he did the original sentencing. But you see, under this 1996 law, under which they were charged and convicted, it turns out he had no judicial leeway. He could not mete out a sentence that was proportionate to what the crime was. So, yesterday... Dwight and Steve went to prison again. Dwight will be 79 when he gets out. Steve will be about 50. Meanwhile, Harney County on the ranch, Susie will continue to try and survive. 6,000 acre ranch. She needs grazing permits to make this happen. It would be a cruel and unjust act, by the way, if access to those grazing permits that allow them to work were not extended, what possible good could come out of bankrupting a grandmother who's trying to keep a ranch together while her husband sits in prison or son sits in prison? What possible good? They'll serve their sentences. There's nothing short of clemency that the president only can offer that we can do. But we can change that law, and we should, so that nobody ever is locked in like that is for a situation like this where a senior judge literally on his final day on the bench said, this goes too far. It goes too far. They appealed that, by the way, and lost, but... I believe the judge was right. We have, to, we have to listen to the people. We have to understand why events like this are taking place in our communities. They're taking place in cities. We've witnessed that. And we try and get our heads around it. There are more people from the cities, so there are more members from the cities. There aren't many of us that represent these vast, wide-open, incredibly beautiful, harsh districts like the one I do. And the people there love the land. It was the ranchers who came up with the concept of the cooperative management. It was the ranchers who love Steams Mountain and know that for them to survive, they have to take care of the range. 
They're good people. They're sons and daughters by daughters by a higher proportion fighting our wars. And die. And I've been to their funerals. So to my friends across eastern Oregon, I will always fight for you. But we have to understand there's a time and a way. Hopefully the country through this understands we have a real problem in America. How we manage our lands and how we're losing them. It's not like we haven't tried here, Mr. Speaker. Year after year, we pass bipartisan legislation to provide more active management on our forests so we don't lose them all to fire, and we're losing them all to fire. And we're losing firefighters' lives, homes, watersheds, great resources of the West. Teddy Roosevelt would roll over in his grave. You know, he created this wildlife refuge in 1908. There were some bad actors there in the 80s, by the way, who were very aggressive running the refuge, basically threatening eminent domain and other things that took ranches. It was bad. And that lasted for at least a decade or more. It's gotten better, though. It's not perfect. But there's a much better relationship, and the refuge and the ranchers work closer together. And in fact, during this fire in 2012, Refuge actually opened itself up to the ranchers for hay and feed because theirs was burned out because of this big fire. So there was a better spirit there, but there's still these problems. And the threat of waters of the U.S. shutting down stock ponds and irrigation canals and a way of life. The threat of fire every year that seems to not be battled right and just gets away and and no one's really held accountable the continued restriction on the lives of the men and women who for generations have worked hard in a tough environment it, it's just gone too far it's hurtful and I I hope people understand how serious this is felt and how heartfelt this is by those who pay their taxes and try and live by the law and do the right things and how oppressed they feel by the government that they elect and the government they certainly don't elect and how much they will always defend the flag and the country and their sons and daughters will go to war and some will not come back and they have not from this area. There's a better solution here. The president needs to back off on the monument. The BLM needs to make sure Susie Hammond isn't pushed into bankruptcy and then her ranch taken by the government and added to those that have been. And we need to be better at hearing people from all walks of life and all regions of our country and understanding this anger that's out there and what we can do to bring about correct change and peaceful resolution. It's not too late. We can do this. It's a great country. We have the processes to do it right. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time.